Good morning, Grace. It's so good to be back and hear all of the good things that are happening here this morning. And part of that is going to be your spiritual renewal days. And uh, as I invest and share with you, uh, I'm going to be talking about what it means to go deep. We are, we, we have a, uh, someone, the old prophet said it, we have a famine of the word of God. Uh, he said it another way than the more contemporary way is that we are, we are a mile wide and an inch deep. Uh, the church is plagued with shallow Christians. And uh, I don't think that's God's will at all for any of us. So let's talk about what it means to go deep. Let's start with what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount. When he gave his core values of the kingdom, he concluded it with some stories and parables. One was about those who build their house on sand who build their house on rock. This comes from that parable. Jesus said, everyone who comes, these words are important, Everyone who comes to me hears my words and does them. I will show you what he's like. He's like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And the rest of the story is when the storms came, the floods rose, it didn't shake it at all because it's built on the rock. I've been fascinated with the military all my life. And some of you may have been a Marine. Any Marines here this morning? Ah, I see a few hands going up, some old Marines. Well, Marines are a special group of guys, and you may recognize this sign. It's from South Carolina, Paris Island, Eastern Recruiting Region. It's inside the base near the recruiting station, but it's the third sentence on this sign that captivated me. They unload these young men off their, those buses. The drill sergeants are screaming at them and marching these kids with peach fuzz on their face and confusion between their ears. And they march them right under this sign. And can you read that third line? What does it say? What difference do you think they've got in mind for those Marines? Now we got some here that know. What difference do you think Uncle Sam's got in mind? What in the world is he going to do over the next 12, 16, 18, sometimes 24 months to take these young men, transform them into a fighting machine that could be dropped out of a stealth helicopter or out of a boat anywhere in the world and where their boots hit the ground they can take down an Osama bin Laden. They can take, establish a beachhead. They can bring a captive home. They can do almost, almost anything required of them by the government. A transformation process takes place until they look like this. You can still spot an old Marine when you walk down the aisle at Walmart. He's ramrod straight, look you right in the eye, and say, yes, sir, no, sir. A transformation. Now, if the military in this present world can take people through a set of training courses and transform them into something unbelievably powerful, what do you think the God of the universe who created all of this has in mind for you and I? Do you, do you think we can etch these words over the doors of your sanctuary? When you walk under them, you look up and say, where the difference begins. There is this strange statement in the book of Ezekiel with the prophet, where God told the prophet, he said, you tell my people, if they come into the temple through the southern gate, not to go out that gate. You have to go out another gate. You think God's interested in egress and regress? No. He's painting a word picture like this. You never come into the house of God and leave the same way. You never come into the presence of God and leave the same way. It's transformative. And God has something in mind to grow us and make you and I deep Christians. He said he appointed 12 so they would be with him. 
For three and a half years, he walked, he talked, he slept, he ate with a group of guys. And then he turned them loose and they turned the world upside down. That's literally what they said in the books of Acts. These people who are come hither are turning the world upside down. Well, the word's upside down and it needs to be turned right side up. And you're the people to do it. But only you can do that if you're allowing him to transform you and make you something that you ought to be. It's only those kind of people who can do, make disciples, baptize them, and teach them to observe all that I have commanded. Now, if that's going to happen, he needs mature, transform, Christ-like Christians to work in his kingdom. Got any volunteers? A little, 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 little soft there, I'm afraid. So, we know it, God knows it, the desperate need today is not for a greater number of intelligent people. We got a lot of smart people or even gifted people. What we need is deep people. So, when we talk about, is this a cliche, just another religious cliche, or does it actually mean something? What do we mean when we talk about going deep? Well, here's what I mean. I mean intentionally cooperating with the Holy Spirit as he uses the Word of God to bring about the renewal of our mind and the formation of our character into the image of Christ for the good of others. Now, I know that's like drinking out of a fire hose, that statement. It's a mouthful. But every word counts. It's intentionally cooperating. Being born in a garage wouldn't make you a car. And just coming to church, showing up, sitting there, checking it off, thinking about what's the meal that we're going to, this luscious meal we're going to have in a minute. That didn't make you a deep Christian at all. It's intentionally cooperating with the Holy Spirit as he uses this book through the Holy Spirit to transform our mind and shape our character into the image of Christ. So why spend these days talking about it? Well, there's some serious reasons you want to do it. Number one, growth is a major emphasis in the New Testament. When you look at the, the New Testament as a whole, most people just sort of, oh, that's the gospel. That tells people how to be born again, how to, how to get them into kingdom and get to heaven. That's an infinitesimal part of it. It's a 10 to 1 ratio on the, the gospel passages, simply how to be saved, how to be converted, being justified by faith, explanation of all that versus the growth aspect, 10 to 1. Simple way to put that is, in most people's minds, what's important? Well, get born again. Get born again. Get saved. 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 Well, live it. The New Testament's just the opposite. Get saved. But live it. 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 Grow. Be transformed. Live out the gospel. That is the bulk of the New Testament. You and I know that little boys don't become great generals by just playing soldier. There's some intentionality that has to be put to it. Second reason, there are significant post-conversion expectations. You say, you mean there's something beyond just surrendering my life to Jesus, being born again? Yes, there is. And they're in the New Testament. They're post they, I'm only going to give you a few. Paul made a statement to the Roman Christians, these five-star Christians in Rome. He said, you need to present your bodies a living sacrifice to God. Wow. It's with our body that we have sinned. Our tongue spoke evil things. Our feet took us to the wrong places. Our hands did bad things. It's also going to be now with our bodies that we do holy things for God. So present that body totally to God. Paul makes an interesting statement to the Ephesians who were really the five-star Christians. He said to them in a prayer, let Christ dwell in your hearts by faith. He's talking to Christians here and he's talking about something they still need to do. Now, you see that welcome mat up there? Either side. How many of you ladies have a welcome mat in front of your house? You have one? Do you? Do you mean it? Yes. <laughs> really? 
You actually mean it? I doubt it. I doubt it. Here's what you mean, I think. Let's see. I don't know, maybe. Here's what you mean. You mean, welcome to a room in my home. Living room, maybe the kitchen, maybe the dining room. You know, it depends on. You don't mean, welcome to under the bathroom sink, <laughs> under the bed. You don't mean that, do you? <laughs> Closets. <laughs> the secret drawer. You don't mean that. The word that Paul used here, let him dwell. It's the idea that Jesus isn't just invited in as a guest. The keys are turned over and he can go anywhere he wants. It also, it's, it's, anybody got any tea drinkers out here? Any of these connoisseurs of fine teas? You know, you, you, you get the water to a certain, and then you take the tea bag and you do this until the tea permeates every ounce of water there. It also, that's, a, that's another way of saying what that means. There comes a point beyond conversion. Christ has everything Amen. in our life. Present yourselves as slaves to righteousness. You just witnessed a presentation. Do you remember that Jesus as a child was presented in the temple to the priest? That's what that word means. Same word used to, in presenting Jesus to the priest. These parents presented their baby to God. Paul is talking to Christians and he said, beyond your conversion, there will be a point you really need to become a love slave to Christ. And then he told the Ephesians to be filled with the spirit. They already had the Holy Spirit indwelling in them. What's he talking about? He said, I want you to intentionally and willfully allow the Holy Spirit to control and influence your life completely. Post-conversion expectations. And then there's the biblical norm for Christians is a steady transformation into the character of Christ. This is one of my favorite passages in the New Testament. Paul said, and we all with an unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord through this book, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. It's actually the word transformed there is a word that we've brought into the camera world. If you see this old camera there, they had a lens cap. And these old cameras, they would set it up and they'd tell everybody, be really still, don't move. And they would pop the lens cap, count so many seconds, put it back on. What were they doing? They were exposing that film to the image in front of it. And whatever the image out there was, it would impregnate that film and put the image onto the film. He said, that's exactly what is happening to you and I as we look into his word, as we live in his word, as we gaze upon his glory, we are being steadily transformed into the image of Christ. So you say, ah, that sounds, that, that's great for the uh, super saints. I'm just, I'm, I'm going to stay in kindergarten the rest of my days. Oh, really? Well, let me warn you. What if you don't take it going, going deep seriously? Here's what's going to happen. Jesus said they have no root in themselves. They endure for a while, but when trouble comes, they fall away. 85% of new Christians that are not discipled fall away. You hear what I just said? 85% that aren't discipled fall away. Number two, you become vulnerable to deception and false teaching. So many Christians, <laughs> the devil, oh, that's okay. Well, oh, that's all right. Good. But he can get you sidetracked on all kinds of crazy, weird stuff. Second, there's the danger of being immature to the point of being dysfunctional. You're never any good to the kingdom of God. How many of you parents, uh, nobody reads anymore. So how many showed your kids the film Peter Pan? Yeah, nobody reads it. May or you, somebody may have read it to their kids. You know, Peter Pan. Everybody, well, everybody loves Peter Pan. Who wants to be Peter Pan? He's the kid who never wanted to grow up. Is that what you want to be? The Christian who never grew up and became dysfunctional in adulthood? Well, of course not. But something even more sober. 
you will become a nominal Christian and possibly go through life never knowing you're truly unconverted. It's a very, very subtle thing. Oh man, we like church. This is a great place. Man, we need, we need a little of that for our family. You know, just a, a, a touch. Let's go. We'll, we'll, we'll punch the clock. We'll do the religious checklist for an hour. Might show up to something else, but you know, let's do it. Let's do it. So we're Christian. What you are is a nominal Christian in name only. And realize there's never been a deep conversion in your life. So, what does it mean to be spiritually mature? Well, the New Testament is filled with passages. I'm not going to read them. I don't have the time, but you can see them. Check them off. It talks about holiness, growing up in love, to be perfect, complete, lacking in nothing, standing mature, fully assured in all the will of God, mature manhood to the measure of the stature, the fullness of Christ. When you put all of those together, sort of mix them up and, 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 and bring out a consensus, here's what you're going to find. The measuring stick for Christian maturity is the measure of our Christ-likeness. Paul prays for this almost in every epistle, that you might know the fullness of God, that you might grow into the fullness of the statue of Christ. This is no secret. Every theological system, every faith tradition believes it. C.S. Lewis, an Anglican, every Christian is to become a little Christ. The whole purpose of being a Christian is nothing else. John Stott, God wants his people to become like Christ. For Christ's likeness is the will of God for all the people of God. J.I. Packer, the great reformed theologian, God has implanted a passion for holiness deep in every born-again heart. Holiness is, in a word, God-taught, spirit-wrought, Christ-likeness. And he's right. Every man and woman truly born again, something is, their heart's been, they've been given a new heart, Jesus said. He painted that picture in Ezekiel 36. I'm going to take out the stony heart. I'm going to put in a new heart. I'm going to write my law, not on stone, but on a heart of flesh. And I'm going to put my spirit within you. And every born again heart has this desire to be thoroughly good. You don't even know what it is. But it's this passion for holiness, a passion for Christ-likeness. Dallas Willard said it like this, the great spiritual formation guy. To be spiritually mature is to have the mind of Christ so that we can effortlessly do what Christ would do when in our situation. Now, that's not going to happen the next week after your conversion. But the process is to take you there so that you can, in fact, have the character, not the personality. You're not a God or a little God. You live in the flesh. You've got feet of clay. But... The character of Christ can be so formed in you through the word and the spirit that you can, in fact, live as he would live if he were here in your situation. So, how does it happen? Jesus uttered these words 2,000 years ago, and nothing's changed. He said, follow me. And those two words have significant implications, and there are two of them. One is directional. It means I get in the way with him. Well, what does that mean? If you're following somebody, are you leading? No, he is. If you're following somebody, you tell him, are you are you saying, here's the way to go? No. When it when you follow. It means there's there's a surrender to the leadership of the one that leads. When you follow, it means you're not the boss anymore. There are serious implications to following Jesus. Not only directionally, but replicationally. It means that you start becoming like him. You begin to think like he thinks, behave as he would behave in your situation. Tremendous 
implications. So what the Bible calls following Jesus really just encompasses this whole idea of spiritual formation, of being transformed. And all of us have some level of this, just like everybody in this room has an education of some sort. Some good, some not so good. Everybody has a spiritual formation. Some good, some not so good. We all do. But the point of enhancing that is following Jesus. And this is the process. It's a process of being conformed to the image of Christ for the sake of others. Again, it's not all sudden and it's not all incremental, but it's both. First of all, it's, it can be sudden. It can be pivotal. Jesus introduced the word to the world, the word of being born again. He shocked old Nicodemus when he told him, he said, man, you got to be born again. Don't you get it? If you're even going to see the kingdom of God. And he described that new birth that, that takes place. It makes us a new creation. You can bow before the foot of Jesus in true repentance and come up a different person. That happens in the miracle of a moment. You can't do it. I can't do it myself. It just, it happens in the miracle of a moment. Justified by grace through faith in Christ alone. The miracle of a moment. It happens. That's pivotal change. But most of the change that takes place is gradual. It takes place over time. And it takes place with our cooperation. We have to engage as well. Anybody recognize this quarterback? Peyton Manning. Peyton Manning and the 2007 Super Bowl that took place in Miami. I was in a uh, conference in Florida speaking and the Super Bowl was going on. And Peyton Manning was quarterbacking for the Colts. He knew that year that they had a good chance of going to the Super Bowl. He also knew it was going to be in Miami. He knew that it wasn't a dome. In Miami it rains. Just sudden thunderstorms come up. And he said, you know, that ball can get wet. So you know what he did? For the entire year leading up to the Super Bowl, every day when, when the practice was over, he and one of the trainers spent one hour throwing wet footballs. He had them in barrels and, 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 and soaking during, during regular practice. And then the trainer would toss him a ball and he spent one hour every day after every practice for a whole year throwing a wet football. You know why? To win the Super Bowl and he won it. It rained and the balls got wet. His didn't slip, but the Chicago quarterbacks did. Michael Jordan. They say he'll go down as the greatest basketball player. All you LeBron James fans, come on. But <laughs> Michael Jordan, he's, he, he's probably going to be the king of basketball. Do you actually think at 17 years old, he decided, you know what? I'm going to get up off this couch and run down to the gym. And, oh, there's a little orange round thing. Think I'll shoot it and become a star. 10,000 hours of practice. It's proven it takes 10,000 hours of practice to be great. To do what a Peyton Manning can do. Or a Tom Brady can do. Or a Michael Jordan. Or a LeBron James. Or a Yo-Yo Ma. 10,000 hours. And some people are looking at me this morning. Who can't spend 10 minutes with God. Or they feel like, wow, what a sacrifice I just made. I gave him 10 minutes. And they wonder why they're, they're just Peter Pan Christians. They wonder why they always succumb to temptation. They wonder why there's no victory in their life over willful sin. So, what does a deep Christian look like? Well, let's click it off here. Number one, they know God. And they're known by him. Now, I'm not talking about intellectual knowledge here. That's not what I'm talking about at all. The word know in, in the both New Testament and Old Testament. In the Old Testament, the word know is first used when it said, and Adam knew his wife Eve. I don't need to translate that. You get it. 
The word no in Hebrew always carried the idea of communion, of intimacy. Uh, some of you that you've laid eyes on me for the first time today, you know, you heard him say my name. So you could write to to say, I know Mike Avery. Well, not really. You don't know Mike Avery like my wife knows Mike Avery. Some people say, I know the Lord. It's not just an acquaintance, a brushing acquaintance. It's an intimacy, a communion. And the Lord knoweth them that are his. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. And so deep people know him, walk with him, commune with him. Deep people, their lives are marked by strength, humility, obedience, victory over willful sin. They manifest wisdom. They have discernment because their minds are biblically transformed and informed. This book is like a compass to them. And they live and walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. Paul says, if you live in the spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. If you live in the spirit, you will manifest the fruits of the spirit. Walking, living in the spirit. So what's the pattern? What's the big picture? That's what we're going to talk about uh, the rest of the week. We're going to cover these three areas. If you had a sort of an umbrella picture of what it meant to go deep. First of all, it en encompasses the idea of knowing God rightly. You have to encounter God. You have to know God rightly. We'll talk about that tomorrow night. Big, big deal. But you also have to encounter yourself. You've got to be willing to lift the hood. How many of you wives have said many times to your husband going down the road in the truck or the car and said, I think I hear a noise out there. And he said to you, nah, there's nothing, there's nothing, there's nothing. Why do men, why are men so afraid of lifting the hood? Never know what you might see under there. Well, we all have an adverse reaction to lifting the hood of our heart. Because when we do, we're going to see there's something inside of us. As the prophet said, all we like sheep have gone away. We are incurved to our own self-centered ways. And we're also going to see not only has sin defiled us, we're going to see sin's damaged us. It's kind of, someone said when Adam fell, he fell on his head. Uh, we've been kind of messed up. And so there are consequences and we need, to, we need to see that. It's important. But we also need to encounter the Holy Spirit because it's the Holy Spirit, God's presence on earth, God's power in our lives that can take a damaged, defiled self and make them everything God wants them to be on this earth. So that's the full picture and we want to see it. Now, missionary to Africa in World War II the American Missionary Board said, you've got to come home. The war is coming into North Africa, as you know it did. And so she, she packed up. She got a ticket on a boat, not this one, but one like it. And she uh, was standing at the docks, getting, waiting to, load, to, to get on the board of the ship. She decided to write her family a letter. And she wrote a wonderful letter about what God's doing in her life and how God was working. And she dropped it in the post. And then she got on the boat. But a German U-boat found them in the Atlantic and sunk that ship. And her body lies somewhere in the Atlantic Ocean. She never got home. But her letter did. And the last line of her letter said this. She said, I want God to get out of my life all that Calvary has provided. Isn't that the desire of every Christian? Don't you want God to get out of your life everything he's provided? All the provisions, all the spiritual blessings that are ours in Christ Jesus? Don't you want to get that? Don't you want to see that bear fruit and come out in your life? Well, of course, every Christian does. The man you see here is deceased as well. When my wife and I were just young pastors, no children, I was 23. We took our first church, Selma, Alabama. And 
After dinner, I had a little stereo with two knobs. And we'd go turn it on, tune in, and listen to this new program from Pasadena, California called Focus on the Family. And James Dobson interviewed Alan Oggs. Alan Oggs had cerebral palsy. He, never, he could never walk. He, he walked very uh, slowly on crutches. He could never ride a bike. He, could never put a, he, he, couldn't, he couldn't button his shirt. He could not feed himself. You, you get the picture. But he said when he was 16 years old, after breakfast one morning, he told his mother, he could, he could, barely, he could barely understand him. And I'm not making fun. I'm just going to do it for emphasis. He told his mother, he said, Mama, God call me to preach. His mother burst out in tears. This sincere Christian boy thinks God's called him to preach and she can't even understand him. She said, oh, Alan, Alan, I know you love the Lord, but preach. Oh, son, that's, God's got somebody else for that. He has something for you, but not that. He said, uh-uh. God called me to preach. He went to Bible school. Lived four years in a dorm. Couldn't button his button. Graduated the top of his class. Married one of the prettiest girls on campus. Traveled all over America preaching. Dobson's interviewing him. And here's what he said. He said, Dr. Dobson, he said, all over America, people come up to me and say, oh, what an island. I wish I could be a good Christian like you. That year, he had preached 365 times, won 251 people to the Lord, and sold 50,000 sermon tapes. He said, you know what I tell them? I tell them, you want to be a good Christian like me? You can if you want to. You, you, you just got to have the want to. He's right. One of the last things he said was this. This poor, broken, crippled man who traveled the length and breadth of this country to preach the gospel. He said, it doesn't matter what you have to offer him. It only matters what he has to offer you. Every one of us are broken to some degree. Some people don't like to hear that, but it's just the facts. We are. We're all a little bit crazy <laughs> to some degree. We're broken. And so it's not about your capabilities. It's not about your gifts. It's not about all of that. It's about the level of your surrender to God and what you're willing to let him do in your life. And that's what we're going to be talking about this week. How do we let him do that in our lives? Father, I pray your blessing and help on these days of renewal. You know we need them. And you know exactly how to get down right on the level of every man and woman here. And so I pray that you'll do that today and the remaining five times as we meet and talk about what it means to go deep and to grow up. In Jesus' name, yes. amen. amen. You're dismissed. See you tomorrow night. 6.30 tomorrow night. See you.